Yo, today's integral looks exotic to say the least. And in fact, it looks perfect for applying my favorite integration technique, that is integration the Feynman way. So that's exactly how we're going to solve it. We're going to solve it using Feynman's trick. So first up, we're going to call the integral here i for reference purposes. And now we need to define an integral function i of some parameter a. And we're going to define it as the integral from 0 to 1 of what exactly? Where do I place the parameter a? Well, it makes perfect sense to take this x term and replace it with x to the a. So I have the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the a minus 1 divided by x squared plus 1 times log x dx. And you may wonder why exactly does it make perfect sense? Well, if you take x to the a and differentiate it partially with respect to a, then you get x to the a again times the logarithm of x. And this log x term is perfect for cancelling out this log x term in the denominator. And that will give us a much simpler integral to evaluate. And in fact, we can evaluate that integral quite easily using one of the tools I derived a while back. So now that we have a plan, we can differentiate the integral function with respect to the parameter a. And can we or can we not switch up the order of the integration and the differentiation operators? Well, that depends on the convergence of the integral function. So first up, let me make things clear. We're defining a to be a non-negative real number. And as far as convergence is concerned, let's take a closer look at the integrand. We have x to the a minus 1 divided by x squared plus 1, and we know that x belongs to this open interval between 0 and 1. So this function here is bounded on the interval of integration. And this bounded function is being multiplied by the reciprocal of log x. And we know that log x is an increasing function. So that means its reciprocal is a decreasing function. So we have this product of a bounded function times a decreasing function. So by Dirichlet's convergence theorem, we know that the integral converges. And we can, in fact, perform the switch up. So we have the derivative of i with respect to a being equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of the partial derivative with respect to a because of the Leibniz rule of x to the a minus 1 divided by x squared plus 1 times log x dx. And because we're differentiating partially with respect to a, that means all the x terms in the integrands are constants for the purpose of differentiation. So we have the reciprocal of x squared plus 1 times log x times the partial derivative with respect to a of x to the a minus 1. And this term here on differentiation gives us x to the a times log x, as we saw earlier, and 1 just differentiates to 0, right? So we have x to the a times log x dx, the logarithm terms cancel out, and we have this fairly simple integral to evaluate. It's the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the a divided by 1 plus x squared dx. And I'd like to now perform a substitution to get rid of this x squared term in the denominator. So we're going to let x squared equal u, which implies that x equals the square root of u, which implies that dx equals 1 by 2 times the square root of u du. And clearly the limits of integration are not bothered by our transformation. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a, let me just give myself some more writing space here. So, and I just took away the parameter there as well. My bad. Anyway, so this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a equals the integral from 0 to 1 of u to the a by 2 times u to the negative 1 half times 1 half du divided by 1 plus u. And multiplying out the terms in the numerator, we get the derivative of i with respect to a being equal to 1 half of the integral from 0 to 1 of u to the a minus 1 by 2 du divided by 1 plus u. And this integral here can be solved pretty easily using a tool we derived on the channel a while back. And 
that tool makes use of the digamma function, but it's cool. It's perfectly cool if you're not familiar with the digamma function. Because all you need for the purpose of this video, this integral, is the definition of the digamma function, which I'm about to present to you. So hang on there. It's going to be extremely cool and you can make it through this video even if you are not familiar with the digamma function. And of course, you can keep watching the videos and get more and more familiar and develop a liking for the digamma function. Speaking of which, this is a very good time to like and subscribe. Anyway, so the digamma function psi s is defined as the derivative with respect to s of the logarithm of the gamma function. That's it. That's exactly how it's defined. It's the logarithmic derivative of the digamma function. And you can expand this right-hand side here by noting that differentiating a logarithm means you need the argument in the denominator and because of the chain rule you have the derivative of the argument in the numerator. So you have the derivative of the gamma function divided by the gamma function. But it's this bit that we need for the solution development of this integral. Because it means something really cool. It means that if you integrate the digamma function, you get the logarithm of the gamma function. So integral digamma s ds equals log gamma s. And this is exactly what we need later on in the video for the solution development. Now returning to the integration problem, to solve the integral, we need the integral from 0 to 1 of u to the s minus 1 divided by 1 plus u du. Link in the description below for a proof that this integral evaluates to di gamma s minus di gamma s by 2 minus log 2. And comparing the exponents of the numerators in the two integrands, we see that s minus 1 equals a minus 1 by 2, which implies that s equals a plus 1 by 2. So all of this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a equals 1 half of di gamma a plus 1 by 2 minus di gamma half of that. So we have a plus 1 i oh, terribly sorry about that. Again, we have half of that, which is a plus 1 by 4, minus log 2. And now that we have the derivative of the integral function completely in terms of the parameter a, we can recover back the integral function by integrating it with respect to the parameter a. So on the left-hand side, we just have the integral function i of a. Now on the right, we have one half of the integral of di gamma a plus one by two minus di gamma a plus one by four minus log two dA. And remember exactly what we needed to integrate the di gamma function. All we had to do, all we have to do is recall that the integral of di gamma s dS equals log gamma s. So this implies that i of a equals one half of log gamma a plus one by two, and the derivative of this argument here is one half. So dividing by one half is the same thing as just multiplying by two. And by similar token, we have the next term evaluating to four times log gamma a plus one, wait, terribly sorry about that. That is a pretty horrible looking hook for the gamma function. So we have four times log gamma a plus one by four minus a times log two plus some constant of integration c that we now have to determine. And how on earth do we determine the constant of integration? Well, for that, just recall exactly how the integral function i of a was defined. We defined it as the integral from 0 to 1 of x minus 1, x to the a minus 1, that is, divided by 1 plus x squared times log x dx. So this implies that i of a equal to 0 equals the integral of plug in a equal to 0, then you get x to the 0, which is 1. And 1 and negative 1 cancel out, so you're integrating 0 with respect to x, and you get zero. Notice that I made sure to write the limits 
first, because if I did not mention that this is a definite integral, well, I would have been in trouble for writing the right-hand side as a zero, because the antiderivative of zero is in fact the constant of integration. Pretty easy to see using differentiation, of course. Anyway, so we know that i of zero equals zero, so plugging in zero wherever I see a, this implies that i of zero, which is zero, equals one half of two times log gamma one half minus four times log gamma one by four minus zero times log two is just a big fat zero, and I'm left with this constant of integration c. And Gamma one half is, of course, famously equal to square root pi. So this is cool. I've determined the constant of integration. This implies that c equals negative one half of two times log gamma root pi minus four times log gamma one by four. And plugging this into the equation for i of a and Remembering that the target case was i of 1, right? So i of 1 will be equal to 1 half of 2 times log gamma of 1 plus 1, 2 divided by 2, 1. And we know that gamma 1 is just 1 and log 1 is 0. So just ignore this term. Next up, we have this negative 4 times log gamma 1 plus 1 by 4 would be 1 half half and we know exactly what gamma one half equals right that's once again equal to the square root of pi okay cool minus one times log two is just log two and we have to add to it this newly found constant of integration and i've run out of writing space so let me just decrease the size on that plus or rather minus one half of two times log square root pi minus four times log gamma one by four. Now all that's left is to clean up this mess and get a pretty awesome looking result. So multiplying, multiplying out this one by two gives us negative two log square root pi minus uh, log two divided by two. And using the properties of the logarithm, you can write this one by two as an exponent of two, meaning that you have log root two minus again multiplying out this one by half you have log root pi plus two times log gamma one by four again using the properties of the logarithm you can write this as the you can write the argument as the squared gamma function evaluated at one by four or the square of the gamma function evaluated at one by four that is okay that sounded a lot better for some reason anyway i'm not going to overthink it right now i'll overthink it later so we have negative 2 log root pi and negative log root pi so this should give us negative log negative uh three times log root pi and here you have this log gamma squared one by four uh minus log root two and now you can just combine everything using the properties of the logarithm as log gamma squared 1 by 4 divided by... This 3 can again be written as an exponent, right? So we have log of pi to the 3 halves. And this can be written as log pi times the square root of pi... And, of course, we can collect these terms, multiply out the arguments, and, yeah, you get a square root of 2. Again, combining the terms in the square root. We have all of this stuff, and I was not supposed to write this logarithm down here. So, yeah, my bad. Because we just combine everything into a single logarithm. This looks just insane. What a result for an integral. You got the gamma function there. You got the gamma function, the square of the gamma function, which is squared the fun. And you have pi there, you've got root 2, and all of this is enclosed in a logarithm. So yeah, this was pretty awesome. I really liked it. One of my more favorite examples of using Feynman's trick to solve beastly integrals. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.